Let me give you the outline. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1, we're going to cover the whole chapter tonight, uh, but again, we probably will not do that that often, okay? Uh, a lot of these are longer and we have to bust those up. Uh, there's only 18 verses in Ecclesiastes 1. Uh, number one, the vanity of life. Remember the title, Is Life Worth Living? Is Life Worth Living? All right, the vanity of life is one. The second point is the routine of life, the routine of life. Remember, our first message is, is life worth living? And number three, the pain of life. Folks, there's a lot of pain in life. There really is. A lot of heartache, all right? A lot of pain and a lot of heartache. Look at verse one, the vanity of life. The words of the preacher, the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. Of course, in our uh, opening or in our introduction, we said uh, there uh, that Solomon was the writer of Ecclesiastes. And even when he uh, uses the word preacher here, uh, he was not a pastor. He was not a preacher. Uh, he kind of, matter of fact, I think where folks get this, uh, he gave an uh, incense. Uh, he, he, he did, you know, he... He went into the temple at times, all right, and he was giving sacrifices, but it really wasn't his place to do it. Matter of fact, God got on to him uh, for doing that. So, so when you think of preacher nowadays, that was not the way it was back then, all right? Preacher. And then verse 2, uh, vanities of vanities, says the preacher, uh, all is vanity, uh, what profit has a man from all of his labor in which he toils under the sun? And last week we covered, uh, you know, about Solomon. There was two main points. Uh, one was how rich he was. Uh, folks, he had, I mean, he had anything he wanted. Okay, he had servants, he had cattle, he had everything. I mean, he ruled. He was king of Israel. And uh, a lot of times he... You know, he fought, you know, he showed off of uh, that, those riches, all right, there. And the other thing is he at one time was the wisest man in the world. But like I shared with you last week, uh, in his life, he did not finish strong, okay? He, he kind of regressed, all right? At first, he was following after his father's advice, and at first, he was doing. And uh, the point I want to uh, say here is... You know, when you think of the word vanity, uh, three words came to mind. Uh, life seems empty. You know, life is empty to a lot of people. Uh, life is unfulfilling. It is unfulfilling and it is futile sometimes. Those are the three words that I, I think of. Matter of fact, uh, when you read the vanities of vanities, and we said uh, that that word was used 38 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, you, you almost get to thinking everything is a burden, okay? Everything is a burden. Uh, when, he, when you look at Solomon's life as he is writing this, uh, you, know, you know, later on in life, uh, if you looked at his countenance, uh, you, would, you would see, you know, just a burden, a, a worn face, uh, one that, uh, you know, is, is just, uh, you know, not happy, uh, not excited about life. And uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I want to talk about this thing uh, about money because I know a lot of people, and I've heard them say this, that money makes you happy. Okay? And folks, I am telling you, there are rich people that are miserable. That are miserable. And I understand it solves a lot of problems, but it will not solve all your problems. Okay? You think of movie, movie stars that have taken their lives, I mean literally committed suicide. When you look at them, they have everything. And, and truly, is life worth living is the question tonight. And I want to answer that right off the bat. If you know Jesus Christ, it's worth living. Okay? But if you are depending on the world, and the economy and how much money you have, uh, you are going to 
uh, vanity is going to be in your life. You are going to be empty and unfulfilled. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. And how can you be content when you have everything? Because if you, you know, most of you have looked at the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll start that in verse 4. All these things that Solomon had, and he still wasn't content. He did not have the joy of the Lord in his life. But being content uh, with what you have is very important part of joy in being a Christian. The world says you need more. Most people, feel, most people want more. But I'm telling you, godliness will make a Christian happy. All right, And it says, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we will carry nothing out. I'm just telling you, folks, you're taking nothing with you. All right, Job said, naked you came into the world, and naked you'll go out. You may be in a coffin, all right, but you're not taking, I mean, you can put the money in, in, in the coffin, all right? I, you know, there's been some people even buried in cars. They love their car so much, instead of a casket, they're buried in their car. That, that's just crazy to me, all right? You not taking anything with you. Now look at verse 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. What is he talking about? He's talking about the needs of our lives. Food, shelter, and clothing. And folks, the thing that we don't understand in America, because every time, every time I've been in a foreign country on a mission trip, they all say the same things. You Americans are rich. You are rich. All right? They get up in the morning in Mexico. I've been there. I, I built, you know, I helped. I, I was head of the building at Juarez, Mexico. And in the west side there, out, it was built on a trash dump. Okay? Their deal is two things when they get up in the morning. One is something that they can make a fire with. They need fire to cook something, okay? And if they could make any kind of tortillas and find some rice, their day, they, they, they have fulfilled what they, about, about what they did in a day's time. Whereas we, I guarantee you, we could live three to four, or maybe even five months over what is in our refrigerators and in our uh, storage places, okay? And so the deal with Solomon was, was he had all this stuff, but yet, you know, in his mind, his needs were not being met, okay? In his mind, you know, it was all vanity. It's just a waste of time, all right? And we as Christians, folks, we need to be content with what we have. Uh, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a, stare, uh, and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So we see there all the things money does to people. The temptation is there just to waste money. The temptation is there. Uh, you know, you can see uh, lust is another thing that comes with temptations, all right, which it says there. And, and they are harmful. Uh, they make foolish, foolish decisions, all right? I can't imagine being so rich to be on one side of the United States and take a private jet to go to a restaurant on the other side of the United States. But rich people do that, okay? The yachts, all these things, folks. I'm just telling you, Solomon, comparatively, okay, he had everything money could buy, but yet he just says, it's vanity. It's all vanity, all right? And, and contentment, folks, is just thanking God for what you have, not, you know, being envious of people that have more. And the thing in your Christian life that you have to understand is, folks, we don't need to compare. Christians should not compare, all right? It's who you are. It's what God wants you to have. And you can be content in 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 you know, a small house. You can be ten. I remember the first house that Laura and I have. It wasn't even a house. It was a trailer. Okay? Our rent was $100 a month when we got married in 1980. All right? And, and you know, we thought, 
not that that was a lot of money, but I was just thinking, hey, this is fine. This is nice. We, we, we really did. The only thing I didn't like about a trailer, they're hot, hot in the summer, and they're cold in the winter. But it was home. It was our first house. All right, so be content with what you do. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay, for the love, money is not evil. Money is not evil. Okay, it's not. You need money to pay the bills. You work for money uh, so that you can provide for your family. So money itself is not evil. It's the person that is spending it. It's how they spend it. It's the motive, all right, for what they, what they do with that money can be evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now notice the word here, strayed from the faith. I'm telling you folks, there's so many temptations in money, so many temptations. People have walked away from God because they have been successful. And I got news for you folks, the reason you are successful is because of God in the first place. So we need to keep that in perspective, all right? Look at Luke chapter 12, Luke 12. Go with me to Luke 12. Jesus is sharing this parable of, a, of the rich man. Luke 12, verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he was very successful. All right, very successful. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have uh, many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be, and be merry. Folks, I am telling to rich people and even Americans, this is what they think. They think life is eating, life is drinking, and life is laughing. Okay, and you see the parallels there uh, with Solomon and his writing. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then who will those things be which you have, have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. And folks, uh, Jesus even said, you cannot serve God and mammon mammon and it could be money or it could be the things of the world you can't you can have and, and again please don't get me wrong there's nothing wrong with having money if god is first in your life you can use that money for a lot of good but as we start here he uses the word in verse three what profit all right and and i i've been around people folks I, you know, I've seen them get off an airplane and run to a terminal and look at the stock market. The first thing they do when they get it, why? Because they've invested stuff and they want to know how much money they've made. Folks, our money cannot possess us. We will not be happy in life. We will not have the joy of the Lord in our heart if everything we do is all about money. And matter of fact, it seems that people are never satisfied. Those who even have money want more. So there's a lot. When you think about Solomon, he had everything, but he was still unhappy. He said, I still feel empty inside. Now look at verse 4. So we see the vanity of life. We see the routine of life. He starts in on this. Uh, there's three things that you will see here that he is speaking of. One, if you're taking notes and want this, earth. One is the earth. Two is the sun. Three is the wind. And four is the sea. Talking about the routines of life. I'll say them again. The earth, the sun, the wind, and the sea. One generation passes away and another generation comes. And some people call this the circle of life. The circle of life. And it is a great analogy because think about, what do you do? You, you start out and you're a baby and you can do nothing for yourself, all right? And then you mature into a young adult and you go to a medium adult. And then to, you know, as you go on, the circle of life is 
towards the end. And folks, it's, it's the life cycle, okay? What you used to could do, you can't do now, okay? And even us, we, my age group, my generation, all right, what we have done with our parents is we have begun, the, begun being their parents, okay? And they are the children. And folks, I, I'm not knocking that. I'm, I'm just telling you it, it's how it is that comes a full circle. Think about the earth. The earth is a full circle, all right? You start in one direction, and you'll always be going in that direction. So he gets more to the philosophy of life here. He was talking about profit and money and happiness, all right, in the first part, uh, the vanity of all that. But then he gets into the routine of life. But the earth abides forever. Folks, I'm telling you, when God spoke it into existence, it has always been that way, okay? The earth has always been that way. He created the earth for man to occupy it and to work. Verse 5, the sun also rises and the sun goes down. You can guarantee that every day. You don't have to wake up and ask yourself, you think the sun will rise today? It's going to happen, folks. And to some people, that almost seems routine. Uh, and it hastens to the place where it arose. The wind goes towards the south. And being in Oklahoma and Arkansas, the wind seems to always blow. Okay, it blows. Sometimes it's from the south, which is usually a warmer wind. Sometimes it's from the north and turns around. The wind whirls about continually. And you know the other thing about nature it really never changes, okay? I mean, you know, I understand daylight savings time, but it, it, the earth in all that, the, the cycle is the same. The seasons, okay? We have four seasons. Now, I know occasionally we'll have three of them in a week's time, all right? I just, sometimes it's just crazy. I mean, three, two or three weeks ago, we just say, it's raining too much, it's too cold. And now what are we doing? It's too stinking hot. Well, folks, you're in summer, okay? We have winter, we have summer, we have fall. We, we, you know, we have all the spring is the other one. And turns around to the north, and the wind whirls about continually and comes again on its circuit. So you see this. Nature seems to never change, but there are different weather patterns. Have you noticed how crazy the weather patterns are now? I mean, you know, tornadoes, uh, you know, uh, you know, disasters, floods, okay, all these things are happening, okay? And then we see the sea, verse 7, he says, all the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. I've always wondered that about the Mississippi and those ones that run, they just run, and if you've ever been on them, one like that, and when it was at its peak, I mean, that the, they're just flowing, it's going fast, but yet you get to the ocean, Every time we go to Orange Beach, Alabama, I walk out there and I look, yeah, it's about the same as it was last year or the year before. Okay, there's some things, okay, that just really doesn't change. That's what he's saying. He says, how does that happen? To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing it, nor the ear filled with hearing it. All right, I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I wish the city folks would just go out in the country and sit down and listen to the birds sing. I wish they would. And folks, that's one of the reasons I love to ride a motorcycle, because I see so many beautiful things. We were going to Jasper, saw a, a, a big doe, big doe, and a little fawn right behind it. Okay, you see the, the water places, the springs that you, and, and the rivers that we went on. And again, folks, when you get up to the restaurant there on Highway 7 and you look out across there, I don't know how somebody could say there's not a God. I just don't understand that. All right? But they don't seem to be satisfied. That which has been... And that is which will be. I'll tell you the other thing that amazes me is, is pictures from outer space. When these guys are on these, you know, you know, ship, not ships, but rockets and whatever they do, these man things, and you just look back at the earth and you look at the earth, or you're out there and you see the billions of stars that are out there. That just blows me away. All right, it really does. That which has been is what it will be. 
that which is done will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Does that remind you of anything? A song? Que sera, sera. Okay, what will be, will be. The future, I can almost see. What was that on? Why do I know that, Thurman? I have no idea why I know that. Uh, okay. Verse 10. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. This is new. And the thing you have to understand about the writing is Solomon was writing. I, you know, the day in which he was writing, there, were, there was not technology like there is now. Okay, I mean, you can literally get on a phone or on an iPad, and I can be in the United States, and I can talk to someone in China. I mean, I can see them, and they can see me, and we can talk. You know, even when you see this, there are some new things, all right? But still, there's some, some things that will always be, and they will never change, okay? I remember, you know, the the first set of rabbit ears we got. We had a TV, all right? And, 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 you know, Dad, you know, got the rabbit ears. and Then next he got the antenna, but the antenna deal was he had to get on the ladder and go to the house and move the antenna for certain challenge stations like that. Now it's just incredible. It is incredible. It has already been in ancient times before us. And again, I think he's speaking of man before, the, before him. There's no remembrance of for, former things. Former things. What is he saying? You know, basically, you're going to die, and after a hundred years, you will be forgotten. Okay? Can you see the, the fatalistic view that he has of life? And folks, here was a guy that had everything, and he has this fatalistic view. Nor will there be any remembrance of the things that are to come. You know, it, back in those days especially, it, you know, predicting the future and seeing out, okay, I mean, the technology we have today is incredible by those who will come after. 1 Corinthians 15, go with me. 1 Corinthians 15. Good scripture here. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection. This is Paul speaking at the church, to the church at Corinth, and he's answering that question. Uh, but if there is no res re resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. And folks, that's the way the world looks at us as Christians. Why do you go to church on Sunday? Why do you give money? You could invest that money. Why do you pray? Why do you pray to somebody that you've never seen? You say it's a God, but we don't think it's a God. We don't even know if there is a God out there. Why do you do these things? Okay, that's what the world says. Paul was dealing with those very same things in his days. And folks, we know the difference between us and that fatalistic view is we know Jesus Christ is risen. We know by faith that he lived a perfect life and was born of a virgin. We know, we know these things. Verse 15, yes, and we found a false, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified uh, of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not ri risen, your faith is futile. Okay? Folks, that's, that's what he's saying. That's, that's almost like Solomon. And, and folks, I know once saved, we're always saved. But I'm telling you, even a Christian can be depressed. Even a Christian that, that is not close to God, that is not walking with God, or even one time used to walk with God, they can get this mindset, all right, that God is not fair. And why are these people that, you know, that, that do wrong? I've, I used to have youth ask me all the time, why do drug dealers have more money than I? And I'm thinking, you want to be a drug dealer? What's wrong with you? All right, do you know, I do not want to live my life looking for policemen, okay, wondering who I'm talking to. or want, I don't want to live my life that way, folks. It, it's not all it's cut out to be. All right, 
Verse 18, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And here's the verse I want to get to. If in this life only we, we have hope in Christ, we of all men are most pitiful. What is he saying? Folks, I'm telling you, us Christians, we have something that they don't have. And you know what that word comes down to? We have faith and we have hope. It's these, the fatalistic view just says, you know what? There's no hope, all right? I'm going to live life. Uh, you know, I, I've, I even heard it said like this. You know, I get up in the morning, I eat breakfast, I go to work, I come home, I watch TV, I go to sleep, I get up in the morning, I eat, I do, you know, I go to work, I come home, and I sleep. And they have that, that cycle that's going on through their life uh, where there is no fulfillment. And folks, the bottom line here and everything I'm trying to tell you today, and I know you know this, but there are a lot of people that don't know this. A life without Christ is empty. It is futile. It is the wind blowing. There's no direction uh, in what they do. There's no hope. There's no faith. There's no joy in that. And, and I truly believe Solomon was in a backslidden condition, just a backslidden condition where he literally was trying everything to have happiness in his life. And I'll tell you the truth, folks. A lot of times, you know, uh, you know, if we could somehow go back to the way things were, and again, you know, I don't want to really ride a horse to church, and you know, I'm not talking about that, but where things were just not so complicated. Okay, where churches were open and restaurants were closed on Sunday, where church was the place to go, all right? I mean, everybody just stopped. The, you know, time would just almost stop uh, because folks were going to church, all right? I mean, now, I mean, you just look at the television and see all the murders and the hate and all these things that are going on. Why? Because we're looking for love in the wrong places. Folks, love is God. God is love, and in and, and the world, really, folks, they are crying out, okay? They're crying out, and we have the answer, uh, and we know, and Paul was trying to tell these folks, uh, you know, uh, these folks that are miserable, that are just miserable, they need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we see the vanity of life. We see the routine of life. Now let's finish up. Let's see the, the pain of life. Verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And by the way, don't get any higher than king, okay? You don't get any higher. He had all the authority. He had servants. He had everything. And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven, this burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. He's thinking, he's, he's trying to get this deep thinking, this, you know, you know not necessarily theological thinking, but, but psychology thinking. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. This is his summon, summation. I mean, if you look at the first chapter, I'm telling you, verse 2 is the key. I mean, every, every chapter has a key verse. And he keeps saying this over and over. He's just saying it's vanity. Life is vanity. My life is empty. All right? I'm, I'm looking everywhere for happiness and joy, and I cannot find it. Uh, it's, it's like something slippery. I, I'm trying to grab it, and, and I just cannot hold on to it. Verse 15, what is crooked cannot be made straight. And what is lacking cannot be numbered. And I understand logically into mankind, you know, they can't straighten things out. But I'm telling you folks, God can straighten things out. The crookedness there and, and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I am telling you, he, uh, you know, let, take the beach example, all right? If he said, okay, uh, Orange Beach, how many, how many sand things? How many, you know, grains of sand is on that? I'm telling you, God could tell you. God could tell you. He knows the number of hairs on your head, okay? And really what it is saying, okay, he's just trying to say the problem you have, Solomon, is you're leaving God out of the equation. 
And folks, we are doing that personally, and we are doing that in our country. In our country. What do we do? We took Bibles out of school. I am telling you, when I was in the second grade, I can even tell you my second grade teacher, because she's one of my favorite, Mrs. Hamilton. Every morning when we started, the first thing we did is we stood and we pledged to the American flag. And the second thing we do is Miss Hamilton would sit down and she would take a scripture passage and she would read a scripture, scripture, scripture passage every day to us while we were in school. All right? You know what we got in trouble for? Chewing gum in class. What do they get in trouble for now? Just bringing a gun to school with them. Folks, we've left, not we, not the church, but as America, we have left God out of the schools. We have left God out of the workplace. We have left God. And that's why you would have this thought going in your life. You know, it's just vanity. It's all mess. I'm not happy. I'm not content. Verse 16, I communed with my heart. Okay, now he's having a heart to heart saying, look, I have attained greatness. I've gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. Now he's doing a little bragging while he's at it. Okay, my heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge, which is a true statement, all right? And I set my uh, heart uh, to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind. The wind. So here we have the, the wisest men on earth saying, that really doesn't mean anything to me now. Folks, if you think about what wisdom is, wisdom is is knowing the mind of God and doing it. You can know the mind of God. If we don't follow through, folks, you are not wise. That is not wisdom. And, and I understand David made a big mistake. That, the deal with Bathsheba, I'm telling you, that is the very reason he had. We, we covered that last week. All right, all those things, the concubines and the wives uh, and the princesses. Because it was mirrored and he really followed in the footsteps. And I'll make the quote I did last week and I'll say it again. What one generation does in modern, in moderation, the next generation will do in excess. And so he saw that and, and he was just even talking about how, how much wisdom he had. And, and, and in his days he did. But folks, when you make bad choices, I am telling you, you are not a wise man. Verse 18, for in much wisdom is much grieved. What is he saying? And folks, this is true. The more you, the more you think you know, if you would just stop and think, you don't know as much as you think you do. Folks, there's only one person that is all-knowing, okay? And that is God. God is all-knowing. And, I, and I tell you, I'll even go as far as this. For me personally, the hardest person to witness to is somebody. There's two people. One, they're rich. I had a rich man tell me once, why would I do that? I've got everything I want. I was witnessing to him. He said, why would I, why would I have to surrender to somebody and Pray and do all that. I've got everything I want. And you know the second hardest person for me personally, and this is just for me personally, is the super intelligent. Okay? Because they cannot deal with faith. They just can't. They want to see it. You've got to prove it. Okay? And I'm just telling you, a lot of this Bible, if they read the stories in the Bible, and they think it's fiction. They think somebody's just making this stuff up. Okay, I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm just telling you, that does not compute. You know what most of them look at it? They look at it scientifically. Okay? Let me start with this, okay? Let me give you one that just throws them off base. A virgin birth. I mean, they look at you like you're an idiot. And they will literally say, that's impossible. That's impossible. And I said, in man's eyes, it is impossible. But with God, I mean, I'm just quoting Scripture, all things are possible. But to them, unless you can prove that, okay, and that's what he is saying here. It's almost like he's saying, I'm the smartest guy in the world, yet I know I don't know everything because I'm not happy, okay? 
I'm not happy. Then he says, and he who increases knowledge increases in sorrow. It's just almost like, you know, I, you know I've, my head is about to pop. I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. I know so much, but I really don't know anything is what Solomon is saying. It's almost like life is a burden. Uh, it's like, you know, you know, I can't change anything. You know, there's pain. You know, they'll say stuff to you like, well, why do babies have to die? Why do people die? Does, does God not care about those things? Okay, they try to figure these things out, folks. And I'm telling you, there is pain in life. There, there's pain. I mean, you think of the cross and you think of Jesus Christ. I mean, you think of what he went through, the pain he went through for you. All right, we're, we're, we, you know, when we get saved, we're not wrapped in bubble wrap. All right, we can't, you know, you think of the diseases. I've heard people say this. I've literally heard people say, my mom was one of the best Christians I've ever known. Why did she have to die of cancer? You answer that one for me. You see, and, and folks, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes these folks are so smart, they just can't figure it out because they leave out the God factor. And folks, I'm just telling you, we as Christians, we should have the most hope of anyone on this earth. We should be the happiest and the most joyful person on this earth. Why? Because we have Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Two, two things, and I close with this. Two things, two keys to answering the question, life is worth living. Philippians 3. Go with me to Philippians 3. And I'm done. Philippians 3, two things. Philippians 3. It would be nice if I could find it, wouldn't it? Okay, there we go. Philippians 3, verse 7. Two keys. Two keys. Number one is knowing God. You want to be happy in life. You want to have purpose in life. You want to have, and, and again, folks, I believe Solomon was saved. All right, I don't, I don't believe he lost his salvation. I just think, he sank in all these worldly things were influencing him. Here it is, Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted a loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. What is Paul saying? I've tried that, man. I've had everything. Okay, I was a Pharisee. I was pro I, he was probably part of the Sanhedrin. He had money. He had power. He could arrest people. He had uh, the world's blessing. He had all these things. But he's saying here, they, they meant nothing to me. Looking back in my life, they really meant nothing to me. Nothing. And it says that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from, from God by faith. He's saying I was looking in all the wrong places. I was being righteous. I, I had the robes. I was a Pharisee. I played the religious game, but it still left me empty. And here's the key, all right? Knowing God that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. What he is saying is, and what I believe Paul is saying is, listen, the closer you get to Christ, the more that you know about him, the more you will be content, the more you will be happy in life. And folks, uh, there's, there's really basically two ways to know him. Know him, know him through prayer, and we know that. Pray, pray without ceasing. Pray, pray, pray. And the other way to know him is get in his word. Get in his word. We, you cannot separate growing from reading the word of God, studying the word of God. We need to become students of the word of God. And then the second thing, the second key is not just knowing him or being saved. It's serving God. It's serving God. Look at uh, uh, Psalm 100. Psalm 100. 
Knowing God and serving God is two keys to being fulfilled in life. Make a joyful shout unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Folks, being a Christian shouldn't be a burden. Serving the Lord wouldn't be, oh, i got to go to church again. i got to go. Why? Because they tell me I need to go. That should not be, oh, I've got to read my Bible. <laughs> it shouldn't be that way, folks. It's knowing God. It's being close to God. It's, it's being intimate with God. It's sharing uh, your life with God. It's, it's finding God's wisdom. And then it is serving the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. Folks, that's step one. Folks, God created everything. God sustains everything. God saves you. God's going to take uh, you to heaven with him. He is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. There's a lot of people in the world that don't believe in creation, folks. They don't even believe in it. But, folks, my Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. And he's looking after us. He is looking after us. Entered to his gate with thanksgiving. What is thanksgiving? It's being content with what you have. It's not being envious or jealousy or, or just thinking, man, I, I need, I need, I need. And really what you're saying, I want, I want, I want. Folks, be content. Be thankful for what you have and into his courts with praise. Have you noticed all the way down through these verses, it has to do with praising God. The happiest people I know, folks, and the ones with the most joy in their life are the ones that know how to praise God. They know how to worship. They know how to worship. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures all generations. And I close with this. I just wrote in conclusion, first, this side of heaven, there are no explanations for some things that happen, and God is not obligated to explain it to you, okay? Hey, folks, there's a lot of things that happen in life, and I don't know, I don't know why that happened. Okay, a lot of times that has to deal with death. But, folks, I'm just telling you, you know, I even heard people, well, I want to talk to God. When I get up there, I want to talk to God. All right? You know what I say? When you get up there, you're going to forget everything down here. You've got a new body. You've got a glorified body. You are in a perfect environment. Folks, I can't imagine what it's going to be like to not have sin and temptation in our lives. Who would not want that who is a Christian? That just blows me away. I'm not asking God anything. All right, I'm not asking him anything. I'm just going to thank God that he invited me to heaven. The second thing, God has ordained that his people live by promises and not by explanations. Folks, we can't explain everything that happens in life, but we must live by faith and not by sight. And this I know, our God is faithful. So when we look at the first, you know, of Ecclesiastes, I truly think you're looking at a man at once was very close to God and made, I mean, to be the wisest man in the world, folks, you're making good decisions. But I'm telling you, Satan was just chipping away at him and chipping away at him and chipping away at him. And folks, that's what the world is doing. That's what Satan is doing to us now. He's just, he's chipping away at our morals and chipping away at our values, and chipping away our priorities. And folks, we have to stop. We have to realize, man, life is worth living. Being a Christian is fulfilling. And knowing and serving God is the key to being content in life. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. And God, I pray that you just continue to speak to us and in, in, in the word as we study this book. God, life is worth living, Lord. I, I really, even on Mondays, I, I don't understand people. Oh, it's Monday. Folks, that's, that's the day after the best day of the week. We should be at our best on Monday, not our worst. And God, I pray that we would just realize uh, that 
Uh, life is full. Life is fun. Uh, life with you is adventurous. God, you speak to us. You talk to us. We can talk to you. We can pray to you. You heal us. You encourage us. You are our refuge. You are our strength. So God, I pray as we just look at this series that we would realize that the world is influencing us. And God, I pray that we would just reject that. I would pray that we would just say, as for me and my house, we're just going to serve the Lord. There's going to be a lot of questions asked in this study. Solomon is asking a lot of questions. And God, I pray that uh, we would do uh, what we need to do. And, and folks, that is go to the source. And the source of everything is God in Jesus Christ. So thank you for the promises. Help us to live by faith. Help us to realize every day is a new day. Every day is a new challenge. And God, we can be happy. We can be content. We can have the joy of the Lord as our strength. God, I pray that tomorrow uh, we will remember all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.